Leon Kennedy, Leon Isaac Kennedy, thank you so much for being a part of the Black Experience uh, and sharing your exciting documentary, upcoming documentary. So what I'd like to do is ask you about the essence of, and the, the sort of the building blocks of how one makes a film, uh, how one makes a documentary. If you could explain that to our viewers. All right. Well, in putting together a project, a project can come in many different ways. One is on the creative aspect. If it's a film or a documentary or a TV series, you're thinking of something. So you have an idea. So then you put the idea, I used to say to pen and paper, and nowadays it's more to you know the computer or whatever way a person is writing. Uh, so you come up with your script, your story, with a documentary, it might just be an outline because a documentary is a different form than a movie. So as a creator, everything has its own form. A movie has a form. A television has a whole different format. Television show and or series. Documentary also has a different format. A play um, has a different format. My famous aunt, Adrian Kennedy, very famous playwright. So a play is a whole different format. Mm -hmm. So you, you come up with whatever it is. So if we're doing a documentary, um, you're coming up with your idea, you're coming up with your outline. Then of course, you have to go out and either make a deal or put money together. Many times people say to me, Leon, I want to be a producer. How do I go about being a producer? People have said that to me for decades. And my answer is always the same. You want to be a producer? Find money. If you can come up with the money, you're automatically a producer. It might not make you a great producer, but you're <laughs> automatically a producer. <laughs> so you've got to come up with the funding. Now, in some instances, it's going in and making a deal. So how do you do that? You might go to a studio. You might go to an independent house, depending on who's doing what you want to do. That's another thing that I teach. To really get into the ball game, you've got to get onto the playing field. So many people, they're not even in the stadium, much less in the ball game. You've got to be where people are doing it. And you've got to somehow get past what I call the gatekeepers, because there's always these barriers, these obstacles, the people that automatically say no, and they're keeping you from the decision makers. So you've got to figure out how you can get past these gatekeepers. Now, I was always, I started very young, started doing radio when I was 15. Uh, I was a disc jockey in five major markets, then started doing television by the time I was 18, doing major motion pictures by the time I was 26. So I always had to figure out, okay, how am I going to get in, in? How am I going to get past the gatekeepers? And I was, very, I was a very determined kid. So if you don't let me in the front door, I'm coming in the side door, the back door, I'm coming through a, a window, I'm coming through the crawl space, but somehow, some way, I'm getting in. Okay. And I never took no for an answer. No was not acceptable to me. Uh, so you find a way either to put money together or to make a deal. And then you go into actually assembling what you're doing. So let me talk about a movie. A movie, you go into pre-production. Now, depending on what your budget is, there are studio films and there are independent films. Studio films, you have a lot more money. They take more time. People are in development sometime for two, three years. I used to call it development hell. You might be in development. You might have your parking space at Paramount. You might have an office. It's prestigious, but you're not really getting your movie done. I always like going the independent route because it was a lot faster. So whichever way you're doing it, you're in what I'll call pre-production. Pre-production is where all the planning takes place and also where you save all your money 
So I always took more time in pre-production than most filmmakers, because as I said, that's where you take care of all the mistakes. That's where you can save a lot of money. So I always paid a lot of attention to the script. And by paying attention, many times it's rewriting and rewriting and rewriting until it starts to develop and take on the life that it should. Okay, so you have your script, you're assembling your crew, which is a whole other job in itself to find the right person. Uh, films that don't have a lot of money, and I never had a lot of money to work with, but I was always a perfectionist in the arena that I had. People, you, uh, if I had a million dollars, two million dollars to do a film, that's considered a low budget film. And people would say, oh, you do low budget movies. I would say, no, I do MEM. MEM, Maximum Efficiency Movies. <laughs> and by that, I mean that all the money went onto the screen. I don't really have a lot of credos for people that have a 50, 60, $100 million budget. They've got all the money in the world to do something. So they should come up with a great project. As a matter of fact, when it comes to a studio, I think it's appalling that they don't have anything that is not a hit, that's not great. What do you mean by saying that, Leon? Well, if you have a major studio, who's a major studio? Warner Brothers, United Artists, MGM. Everybody comes to you first. You get your pick of the best scripts. You get your pick of the best A-list actors, the A-list directors, the A-list everything. So there's, to me, no excuse for not having a really good film. And yet, year after year after year, uh, probably 60%, maybe 70% of the films that are put out are not that good. Why is that? Because they've gotten into packaging. Packaging means, okay, I've got this star name, and I've got this star name, so therefore we can make our foreign sales, we can make our... Uh, pay-per-view sales and so on and so forth. So we can see that it's going to make money. It's a formula. But just because you have the formula and the right so-called people to get sales doesn't mean that you have good entertainment. So to me, that's one of the biggest problems is the packaging of these films that are put out. So many times I look at something and I'll say, did anyone read the, what, what, what's supposed to be a script? Because there sure is no story here. Um, I'm, I'm curious. Let, let me ask you this, Leon, because you talked about packaging and formula. Does that also work when one is making a documentary? So instead of a person saying, I've got a great idea, they say, well, you know, here are these other documentaries that have made money. Uh, so in essence, I'm going to create a formula and then come up with the idea? That is correct. If you're going out shopping a documentary, uh, whoever you're going to shop it to, they have their own idea about how much money it should cost, uh, why it should do well, what are the ingredients needed for it to do well. And so you have to be cognizant of putting those ingredients into your documentary okay. or film. So last question in terms of this, in terms of the outlets for documentaries, so that's what we're talking about right now. How does, what has changed in the last five, 10, 15 years in terms of outlets? And I know that there are more outlets, but is it easier or harder now to get on a documentary on, Leon? Well, absolutely, the biggest game changer has been streaming. Streaming now has only been popular for about five years. It was made popular by Netflix. Now, Hollywood is not a follow the leader type of industry. It's a follow the follower, really. So if one person has a hit, whatever, there's going to be five or six other films that are that same genre. So it's the same thing now with, with new ways to put content out. Netflix 
by streaming directly to a subscription audience two years ago made more money than all the movie studios put together. So therefore, the geniuses at the other studios said, well, well you know, we've got to do something. You know, and to do something is they've all come up with their own streaming platforms now. So you'll have uh, Paramount, you'll have Disney Plus, you'll have HBO Plus, TV's doing the same thing, ESPN Plus, Discovery Plus, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's streaming. So that is the big, big game changer. And everybody is into streaming now, including me. Okay. So then can one assume then because you have more streaming outlets, is it easier then to get content on? Not really. And well, let me put it this way. You can get it on, but to have the right amount of eyeballs to see it or the right amount of subscribers, that's a different story. Uh, it's really called the streaming wars going on right now. And uh, the big companies are putting out hundreds of millions of dollars. Quite frankly, everyone's not going to win. Now, the smaller people, uh, they're putting out dollars. And there's, it's almost like everybody and their dog has a YouTube channel now. Everybody wants to be a star. Everybody is an expert. You know, when I started, you had to have approval from the FCC to get a license for a radio station, much less a license for a TV station. And it cost a lot of money. Well, now anybody that has the equipment that is costing less than $200 can have their YouTube channel and they're on the air yeah. and they're on the air worldwide. Your new documentary, The Observers. And I was curious about what was the, the impetus to make this particular documentary. Could you elaborate on that for me? The Observers, we feel, is one of the most important documentaries to come out regarding ufology um, in decades. Now, there's been a lot of talk recently, even from the United States government, about unidentified objects. They even have a new term now, UAPs. Yet the government does not come out with true disclosure that these things really do exist. By things, I'm talking about vessels that can fly faster and do things that our aircraft or whatever we have cannot do. Now, all of this summer, it was in the news about papers that were to be released. And these papers that were to be released were supposed to go into detail about these unidentified flying objects. Now, we have people in the Navy and Air Force and other branches of military that have seen things, documented things, even took pictures. And yet it's been hush hush. No, it doesn't exist. Well, then finally they're saying, well, there are some things out there that are beyond our capabilities. Even former President Barack Obama came out during the summer saying, yes, I have seen uh, video of some things that are beyond our capabilities. Now, is it Russia? Is it China? Well, we hope not, because if they're able to have things far beyond our capabilities, that wouldn't be good. But the real consensus is, is that this is something from another area, outer space area is what I'm alluding to. And I think it's time that we as a society grow up and also not become so egotistical. Leon, what do you mean by being egotistical? Well, there are 
hundreds of thousands, really, of galaxies. Outer space just keeps going, 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 going. It's never ending. And in these galaxies are suns, and these suns have their own planets. So we're talking about hundreds of thousands of other suns with their own planets. Are we so egotistical to think that in the, all of this vast eons of galaxies, that we're the only place that has intelligence? Well, I would dare say no. So I think it's time to open up to that. Now, even the Pope about three years ago, I believe was getting people ready for a certain disclosure because he said, well, you know, it's quite conceivable that there could be other beings from other places and they would be God's creations too. Well, these things and this type of phenomenon or phenomenon has been going on for thousands of years. It's been talked about uh, in books and, and by word of mouth passed down. But just let's say in the past, oh, 100 years, there's been so many sightings. You, you just can't ignore the evidence. Um, you can't ignore the science that's behind all of this. So we decided that we would do a documentary with the best of the best. What do you mean, Leon? Well, we have Whitney Strieber. We have Linda Moulton Howe. We have John Greenwald. We have William Henry. We have Jimmy Church. We even have someone that was actually abducted. And if you listen to her story, it's quite fascinating. It comes across very, very believable because she's saying certain things that she had no way of knowing. And it's very dramatic for her, traumatic for her. She's been traumatized by this ordeal that happened now several years ago. Okay. So, so there are many people, by many, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people that have been abducted, that have been tracked, uh, that have been experimented on. And it's quite fascinating when you put together the mosaic pieces of this puzzle. So let me ask you this, Leon, what was the, in putting this documentary together, was there one major story incident that was a revelation to you? There was not any one major story because there are so many stories. Uh, I go all the way back to 1971 when I was a young producer, youngest producer over at NBC. And I wanted to do a whole show built around extraterrestrials. And back then the program director was saying, Leon, this is too far out. It's too controversial. Uh, no. And I kept pushing for it, pushing for it. I brought in, finally got a yes, brought in Stanton Friedman and many other top people in that field. Got the highest rating that time slot had, had ever gotten. And now there are, you know, all these different shows, Ancient Aliens and UFO Hunters and, you know, on and on and on. Uh, so disclosure is slowly coming out. What do I mean by disclosure? The fact that we are being visited by extraterrestrials. Now, I think that that's a great thing. All the divisions that we have, let's start with this country. White, black, brown, Asian. All the divisions that we have, much less around the world. You're an African, you're Italian, you're Russian, you're Chinese. Well, what are we going to do? when we're visited by something else, another being that came from far, far away, that's more intelligent than us, they would have to be to get here. We certainly haven't gotten there. Uh, they don't look like us. So now all of a sudden we're gonna realize this is a brotherhood of humanity called the human race. Maybe there wouldn't be so much division. 
Now, I have been told by people in top places that one of the reasons that true disclosure has not come out is because the government heads think it would throw the civilization or the populace into a panic. Uh, how would people feel about religion? How would people feel about whatever the institutions are? I don't think it's going to throw people into a panic. I think it is going to cause some sobering thought, maybe some humility, and then maybe we can open up our hearts to one another and even to them, and it will be a whole new world. Fascinating. Well, let me ask you this, because you had talked about ancient aliens and UFO hunters and bringing in all these experts. What's new about your documentary? What are you telling that's, that's new and different than some of these other programs, Leon? Well, Adam, that's a very good question. Uh, I believe what's new is, first of all, it's up to the date information. John Greenwald has a show, well, not a show, but a company where he's constantly soliciting the government for their unreleased paperwork. And that's his whole job. He's been doing this now for over 20 some years. So he gets the latest paperwork, <coughs> excuse me, that had not been released to the public. Then when you have uh, someone like a Whitley Strieber who uh, he wrote the book Communion uh, many years ago, uh, many other great books, but he's been abducted himself. So when he's coming on and he's sharing things with, let's say, some of the paperwork that John Greenwald has just gotten from the government that has just been released, now we have some other new pieces that other people that are scholars and investigative journalists in this field can now say, oh, yes, so back with World War II, uh, when it was said that Hitler had technology that came from extraterrestrials. Well, now, if we put this piece together with this, this is making a whole lot of sense because, you know, after that, wasn't there some reverse engineering? After Ross, well, was there some reverse engineering when we then came out with all this new technology? And then what about all the technology that's being suppressed that these ETs actually have that would really change our whole economy because we wouldn't be on a fossil fuel system anymore. We wouldn't have to pay for energy because we could do this. And th oh, does that go back to what Tesla was talking about? Mm -hmm. So we're putting the pieces together, Adam. Okay. Uh, and it makes for a whole new, fresh perspective. Well, one of the things I thought was very fascinating and, and also controversial is you talk about the suppression of information about extraterrestrials and the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. And you mentioned CIA Director Dulles, and uh, he was, I, can't, I think one of your guests had talked about that Dulles had been given the authority uh, to assassinate Kennedy if he was to endanger the intelligence community and America. So what's your sort of take on this idea that Kennedy might have been assassinated because he was willing to A, possibly release information about UFOs or extraterrestrials. And then also, I think it was mentioned that he was considering a joint project of going to the moon with the Russians. In my opinion, and of course, I was very young, 15 years old, when President Kennedy was assassinated. But from different research that I've done throughout now the decades, he could have been assassinated and for many reasons, because to me, he was a Renaissance man and there were great things that he wanted to do for this planet, for this country and for the people. And there are other powers that didn't want these things done. 
And therefore, eventually he was taken out. In my humble opinion, by the two Kennedy brothers being taken out and also Martin Luther King, it set humanity back by a hundred years. And why do you think that, Leon? Because these were three people that were visionaries that had a heart for the people. They weren't about money. They weren't about greed. They weren't owned by the major corporations. They truly had a God-given mandate to make this world a better place. I remember Robert Kennedy talking to a group of whites saying, it is abhorrent the, the way that the Negro population, because we were called Negroes back then, that the Negro population is treated and in the way that some of them are living. How is it going to change? We are going to change it. We have to change it. And he was talking to middle-class whites saying enough is enough. It's time to change your mindset. It's time to open up your heart and it's time for a brand new day here. Uh, I don't have to tell you the visions that Martin Luther King had. He was a, a prophet, truly a prophet. Uh, these people were, in my opinion, mandated by God to do certain things for humanity. Now, there's always a battle. Even in the heavenlies, they talk about the battle between the dark and the light, the evil and the good. And evil is always pushing its agenda. Evil feeds off of fear and hurt and anxiety and heartbreak. And there's always these vessels, these, these sellers of the fear and the hurt and the heartbreak. You know, Adam, when you look around, why is it that we can always find money for a new missile? Why is it that this country spends seven times more on military expenses than all the other countries, seven other countries combined. Why is that? We can always find money for that missile, that bomb, and yet we have people sleeping out in the streets, sure, yeah. hungry, going through garbage cans. Oh, by the way, a lot of them are vets. They weren't crazy when they left, but they got exposed to a lot of abhorrent things, it messed up their mind. They got exposed to a lot of chemicals that people don't wanna talk about or pay for the damage and it messed up their minds. And now they're living on the streets and we're not taking care of them as a society? No. No. Well, let me, you know, you make ter terrific points, Leon, about that. But going back to Kennedy for a moment, I mean, do you think how well versed do you think he was at that particular time about, about extra, extraterrestrials? And do you think from what you've learned that he was sort of like you thinking that this might be a monumental moment of people coming together? Or do you think he was fearful of what might happen? Well, let me answer that in a couple of different ways because you, you had a layered question there. First of all, one of the things that Kennedy said early into his office when people said to him, well, Jack, how is it to be uh, the president? And he said, I am amazed at the limitations of the office. There are other powers that are there and put into place and they maintain their secrets or their knowledge as presidents come and go every four years, every eight years. 
but that knowledge and that other force is still there. So in many instances, when it comes to things, and this I do know, when it comes to things regarding the extraterrestrials, that was off limit, even for a president. It was on a need to know basis. You know, every president that has come in has said, I wanna find out about, you know, extraterrestrials and so on and so forth. And they were only shown very little on a need to know basis, but not everything. And so when someone wants to expose much more, then you become a liability. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, no, thank, again, thank you for that, Leon. So one of the most provocative... Oh, let, let me just throw something else at you. Yes. When it comes to certain things that are, it becomes so obvious when things are covered. For example, I've been told that there are structures on the moon. I've been told that our government found out about that. So I have to ask you, when we went to the moon, and we didn't even have the computer systems that we have now. We went to the moon over 50 years ago. Why is it in 50 years that we haven't just gone back and forth on a routine basis? Why is it that we don't have uh, our own structures up there and so on and so forth? Why is it that we haven't gone even much further now than the moon if we went to the moon 50 years ago? There's gotta be a reason. So these are the things that we talk about and dive into mm -hmm. in the observers. And that's the name of the documentary, The Observers. Yes. So as I was saying, one of the most provocative and intriguing elements to me of The Observers is one of your guests talking about elaborately the, the grays, the blondes, and the reptilians, mm -hmm. three alien species who have been on Earth for, if I remember correctly, 275 million years, who have been battling over the planet, battling each other. Now, that's obviously, you know, unbelievable and just uh, remarkable to hear. Tell me what convinced you that that is true, Leon? Well, as far as their timelines, I don't know if that timeline is true. Uh, all I know is this, that every time we put some number on the earth or even numbers on some of the structures, whether we're talking about uh, the Great Pyramid or the Sphinx or some of the other ancient structures. Well, then 10 years later, someone says, well, no, it's much older than that because based upon these rings and based upon this, that's showing another 20,000 years. You know, science, there's such an egotistical stance with science because they come out with something and it's like, this is what we're saying and it's gotta be true. And then 15 years later, it's not true. Because knowledge is always, if you have an open mind, is always constantly evolving. I think spirituality is always constantly evolving if you really open yourself up and, and listen and dig for the truth. So whether it was that time period that you're talking about or not, I don't know. But here are some things that perhaps I do know. When people talk about extraterrestrials or aliens, they lumped it all together. One, one big lump. Extraterrestrials, aliens. Well, that's like lumping together um, mankind. Well, there's Chinese, there's Russian, there's Mexican, et cetera, et cetera. So from my research and talking to many, many people, I have been told that there are different 
species. I have been told that some are good, almost angelic. Some are evil and have an agenda. And some are sort of neutral. They're just doing what they need to do for themselves. They're not evil. They're not good. They're just doing what, what they want to do. Uh, yes, I have been told about the reptilians and the uh, tall blondes species and also the grays uh, and that they have been battling for what they want to do on this particular planet and also what they want to do with mankind, which is um, gets a little out there. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this, because you know, the documentary is fascinating. Why is it, do you think, with all this research you've now done and talking to all these experts, and obviously you have lots and lots of incidents of individuals encountering aliens, extraterrestrials, why do you think that they just haven't just maybe landed, you know, a spacecraft on the White House and just said, we're here? And we're going to do X, Y, and Z. I'm mean, obviously there are tons of movies which depict exactly. That. <laughs> I, was just, I was just thinking of the day the Earth stood still. <laughs> so, that old movie done back in the early '60s. Yes, <laughs> and then I think redone with uh, Keanu Reeves. Keanu mm -hmm. Reeves, but uh, yes, I mean. So why do you think again with the with the research you've done, the people you've talked to, why do you think that hasn't happened? You know, Adam, I wish it would, because that would just speed things up uh, a lot more. I don't really know. It's, it's the same thing. You know, when you get into certain things, and by the way, I do want to say on this documentary, because a lot of people know that I left Hollywood and, and went into ministry, and I've been doing ministry for about the past 18 years, and I still do ministry. I uh, just started doing films and documentaries again, maybe starting two years ago. So I don't want people that just happen to tune in and say, well, wait a minute, he's talking about extraterrestrials and aliens. I thought he was a Christian. I am a Christian. And in my prayer work, my spiritual studies, and in all of my research, I can really put it all together. Um, I believe in God. Uh, being a Christian, I certainly believe in the sanctity of Jesus Christ being the son of God. But also Jesus said, um, my father's house has many mansions. There are other things that were said in the Bible that could very well allude to other beings. And as I said before, some of these other beings may be more spiritual than us. Some of them are very, I've been told, angelic-like. Now, I'll make a distinction. In watching Ancient Aliens, on their programming, every encounter, even in biblical days, to them was an alien, not an angel. Well, I make a distinction. I think that there are angels that were created by God. That's a whole different category. I think that they, there are aliens and aliens are not gods, even though I think early man mixed it up and worshiped some of them as gods. And also, I think that there are demonic entities. Now that's a whole other story that I won't get into on, on, this, doc, on, on this interview, but I actually, uh, do in my ministry deliverances uh, to get what I'll call the negative energy off someone. That's a nice, polite way of me saying it. But the same way that the Catholic Church talks about exorcisms, which are real, if you're Pentecostal, it's just deliverance. And if you believe in the Bible, the ministry of Jesus Christ, he would teach, he would preach, but he was also heal and he would deliver. By delivering, I mean getting 
negative entities off of and out of people. So that's a whole other story, but I'm just saying there are different entities that are out there. Okay. So tell me then, what do you hope that after people watch the documentary, what do you want them to get out of this, Leon? Uh, I would hope that their minds would be open to the fact that there just might be other beings out there. I think that I would like for them, if they come up with at least that consensus, that we'll look at each other differently, that we'll look at each other as the brotherhood of mankind. Doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. Doesn't matter what country you're in. Doesn't matter where you're living. It should be heart to heart. It should be soul to soul. It should be spirit to spirit. And so now we go back to the greatest teaching of all. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Yes. That's what I hope. And I hope that with expanded knowledge, it brings about expanded consciousness. So, no, again, thank you for elaborate, elaborating on that, Leon, uh, and sharing those wonderful thoughts. So tell me uh, two questions. One, uh, how long did it take to make the documentary? The documentary was in the planning stage for over a year. Uh, Roger Richards, great director, great visionary. So it was his idea uh, to do this. 1091 is the distribution company. We had worked with him before on some previous documentaries. And so we came together as a collaboration to do this one. Then it's a matter of putting together all the pieces. By all the pieces, I mean uh, this great dream cast of ufology that we came up with, people that I've already mentioned. Yes. Uh, really great crew. You, you know, the production value and the music and everything was just top notch. So putting it together, then all these people have busy schedules, uh, working out the schedules, then where are you going to film it? How are you going to film it? Uh, then the editing process. You know, documentaries in particular are made or destroyed in the editing room because it just depends on how you're piecing these things together. Whereas a movie, you have a script. So the script is pretty much your Bible as you go from this and this page and this scene and so on and so forth. But with a documentary, you don't really have a scripted documentary per se. So the editing process is very, very vital uh, mm -hmm. for a good documentary. And where can people see this fascinating documentary, The Observers, Leon? Well, thank you for calling it fascinating, Adam. <laughs> it is. It, it, it's, it's, it's provocative. It's fascinating. And it, as a person who is a believer in extraterrestrials, uh, it was eye-opening. I mean, startling, a little frightening. Uh, and I guess that's all good. But I think that there's uh, you bring a lot of elements to the table and it's very informative. So, you know, thank you. Thank you for creating you and your team for creating this project. And again, wh where can people see it? Well, they can go to Amazon and they can go to iTunes and uh, stream it. They can buy it or they can rent it. And also, um, even though you're my dear cousin, who I have always loved ever since you came onto the planet. Uh, still, there are certain things about each other that we don't know because we're on different coasts here. So you just said that you were someone that believed in extraterrestrials. I didn't know that. And because we've been talking about doing some other work together, I was almost a little reluctant to send you the observers because I, I said to Maureen, you know, I just don't know what Adam's thoughts are. And he might think that his cousin has just gone too far out. What the heck is, <laughs> is going on with Leon? So I almost didn't send it to you because I didn't want to uh, blow the other great things that we're talking about doing together. <laughs> oh, no, I think it's, uh, I, I know, I, I enjoyed it. And it's it, what's interesting is it is, I mean, I think you talked about it. I think some of your guests talked about how the UFO community has sort of been 
laughed at and they're laughing stocks and you know it, it's just this is stuff is silly and crazy so I, I think what you've done is you've been very bold and courageous to create something that a lot of people don't want to talk about a lot of people really misunderstand uh, so again it's hats off to you and your crew to, to get the finest people in you know on this particular subject together discussing you know this issue so yeah I think it was very bold and courageous on your part because uh I think, again, it's still a very difficult thing for people to swallow. Well, thank you for that. Um, I really am pushing for people to share their own observances. Uh, we have a, our own SBA channel that's coming out starting in January. It's called The Orn. We want people to share their own observances because there are many, many people out there that have had what I would call a supernatural experience. And in some instances, they have been afraid, Adam, to share what they saw, what they heard, what happened to them or someone in their family. And so we are creating this place of refuge where you can come and have conversations with people that have also had experiences, also have had an observance. And it's, it's safe and no one's going to laugh at you. No one's going to ridicule you. No one's going to think you're weird. And so what we're doing here, Adam, is we're inviting people. Uh, they can write something in to us or they can hold up a phone and, or have somebody in their family film them and talk about what they experienced. We ask people to keep it down to, you know, like five minutes, but some of them we we're gonna actually put on the air and, and, and share them. Now, it didn't necessarily have to be a UFO. It didn't necessarily have to be an ET. You might've seen a spirit, a ghost. You might've seen a, a shape shifter. There are many, many other things out here that go far beyond our five senses. And I think that we need to grow up and become a little more evolved and a little more mature uh, and less egotistical uh, to say that something does not exist just because we haven't experienced it or because we don't believe it. You know, there are a lot of things that um, we don't believe until then you see it and then you experience it. It's called learning. It's called growing. So last question, uh, with all the information that you've gathered, is there a part two in the making? There probably is because there is so much, you know, a documentary can only really be about two hours at the most. So there's a lot that we left on the cutting room floor. Plus this whole observer's, movement that we're starting that I just talked about. Uh, there's going to be a lot of other people and a lot of other information coming in. So I, there probably will be a to be continued. <laughs> oh, no, th Leon, again, thank you for sharing uh, you know, again, your fascinating and wonderful documentary, The Observers. Uh, hopefully people will check it out. I certainly will encourage them to do so. It's been a privilege and honor to get a chance to chat with you. And uh, thank you for uh, taking time out of your busy day to talk about your documentary. Well, thank you, Adam. And I want to say this because you've always been my, my younger cousin and I've always had great love for you from the time that we first met when we were both mere lads. But you are a tremendous, tremendous, first of all, tremendous human being. And I'm also very proud of the work that you and your family are doing and the great knowledge that you're putting out and, and sharing. I, I couldn't be more proud of you. Thank you very much. Well, it's, uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you more about uh, your fantastic career and adding to our, our base of, of tremendous knowledge. This is The Black Experience for all.
If you like what you hear at The Black Experience, please consider clicking on the join button to support our nonprofit. I'm Adam P. Kennedy. Thank you for joining us. This is The Black Experience for all.